Today's dreamer is a woman. She's 36 years old. She's a healthcare administrator, and she has entitled her dream, I Should Call. And here's the dream. I had a dream that I was with my friend at a large park, and then I went to the bathroom. While I was in the stall, a lady with white hair laid down on the ground and was peering into the stall where I was. She was being completely creepy and strange. I was yelling at her to stop, but she wouldn't listen. I remembered feeling she was unwell and possessed. I realized I should have videotaped her actions and called the cops, but I didn't. I left the bathroom, and when I did, I realized that my friend had left me. I thought to myself, I'm going to call him, but I didn't. I then walked over to a large field that was going downhill. I kept walking on it, almost tripping down, but realized I was walking on tons of planted seeds. I felt horrified knowing I was stepping on these seeds, but the strangers around me didn't seem to care that we were trampling these seeds. They were all at the bottom near a fence, watching a scene unfold. You could hear a little girl crying. She kept saying no and stop. She was helpless against her oppressor, and I wondered who was hurting her this way. As I get closer, I can see that it was her mother beating her up. Another lady was videotaping it. The little girl was dejected and sad and hurt. The mother seemed possessed and out of her mind. I said, we need to call 911. Has anyone called? The crowd said, no, nobody has called. Right as I'm about to call, I see another woman teacher has called over the mother to talk to her and tell her this abuse must stop. The little girl stops crying and the lady is saying she will stop being so harsh with her daughter. I am thinking, this is ridiculous. Call the cops, put this lady in jail, she will never stop. I should call, but I never did. For context, the dreamer says, I feel like I am pouring into many people without very much appreciation. I'm a single mother without support. I work a demanding job. I feel I am getting older and have lost my maiden energy. I'm surprised by life being not what I thought. I thought goodwill toward others meant something. But as I get older, I feel like much of it becomes an obligation to love and take care of those around you because it's the right thing to do, not necessarily because you always feel like it. The main feelings in the dream, she says, are longing for resolution and for people to do what's right, feeling shocked by people's actions, the friend leaving, the woman in the bathroom stall, the people just watching a woman abuse her daughter, the abusive mother, the teacher giving the mother a chance to redeem herself. And she finally adds, I have been trying to support a friend who was recently diagnosed with Huntington's disease. The friend who left me in my dream. His actions have been very hurtful toward me as I notice him changing. My mother also recently had a cancer diagnosis and I have been trying to be supportive of her. She was an alcoholic while I was growing up, though we are close now. Somehow there is a link between these two people and my historical desire to help and save people without care or appreciation back toward me. The abusive mother ended up being my old high school teacher. This is a longer, more complex dream. And sometimes what can be helpful with a dream like this is almost to kind of chunk it into scenes. So... Mm -hmm. First, there's this scene of her in the bathroom stall. Then there's the scene of kind of tripping down the hill and trampling on the seeds. And then at the bottom of the hill, there's this scene with this mother abusing uh, the daughter and, and the response to it. So it's, it's kind of interesting just to notice that. And of course, when we do it that way, we can see that there's a kind of parallel 
thing that happens in the first scene and the third scene. In the first scene, there's this kind of crazy old woman who transgresses yeah. and she's sliding under the bathroom stall and it's, you know, it's this, it, she seems possessed. And then mm-hmm. in, the, in the third scene, there's the mother who's abusing the daughter. And again, the mother seems possessed. So that there, there's an echo of, of that those two things are, are somehow parallel. And so that, that helps us understand that when the little girl is being abused, of course, that's an image of a way that the, the, the ego is being, the dream ego is being abused. Because in the first scene, it's the dream ego who is impinged upon by the possessed woman. Mm-hmm. So I wonder about the qua, and I know I'm going right here for the big guns, but I I wonder about mm-hmm. the quality of mother. Mm-hmm. You know, she says she's close with her mother now, but it's very difficult to grow up with an alcoholic mother. And I wonder about her own feelings about mothering, and and what that's like for her. Partly because of what she said in the context, but but also because there's um there's there's something kind of not right here about the the mothering that were that were shown in the dream obviously um the the the, the there is an uh, a, the, the the impulse of the school teacher to say let, let me give you another chance to extend toward the abusive mother um some kindness or or some understanding and yet the dream ego uh, is very impatient with that. But I am wondering if that isn't actually what's needed, that there needs to be some generosity extended toward the kind of possessed women in this dreamer psyche. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I'm paying attention to in the three scenes that you... Uh, elucidated, Lisa, is um, there is no happy resolution at all in this dream. Yeah. Of uh, in any of these scenes of the the first scene of being impinged on by a possessed woman lying down and looking into the bathroom stall. Then the second scene of everybody's trampling on the seats. The you know the hopeful new beginning that something can grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the seeds of growth are being stomped on. And then in the third scene, uh, the, the abused little girl, and uh, the dream ego is not supportive of uh, the woman who says, you have to stop doing this. And the lady says, okay, I'll stop. But our dream ego says no. You know, she goes for a punitive stance of, you should just call the cops and put yeah. her in jail. Uh, um, so I'm just paying attention to the feeling tone that the dream ego repeatedly experiences of something awful, something possessed, something abusive, something uh, trampling and hurting. A- and um, the the. This is a this is a really significant dream of, of pairing it with with her comments of, of I'm a single mother without support and pouring into people without appreciation. Mm-hmm. I think this dream is out picturing this situation, these feelings in the dreamer's life. You look really pensive, Joseph. Well, I think there's um, so many little pieces that I'm just curious about. Any one of them are, mm-hmm. could capture my attention. This um, phrase that she says, um, call, but I didn't. She's going to, in the beginning, there's call the cops, but I didn't. Call the friend, but I didn't. Someone should call, they didn't. But I should call, but I never did. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. The, there's something about the um, the ego's, rep- the mm. repetition of the ego being offered a dramatization of some kind of a, of a crisis that requires 
her ability, the ego's ability to to call out, to connect, to ask for help mm -hmm. or ask for clarification or ask for information or intervention. But it seems that that's the activity I should call, mm -hmm. but I didn't. So she's curious about that, secondary to the various mm -hmm. contexts that might it might have been helpful for her to make a call why why is she so hesitant to make calls and what is a mm -hmm. call so it's it's an action that she would have to initiate it would mm -hmm. require her to to ask something to reveal something and what I would imagine, it would set something in motion that she would then have to be responsible for. Call the friend and say, where'd you go? And risk perhaps mm. conflict or call the cops the first time and then perhaps the second time, which then she would somehow be involved with mm -hmm. a, a repercussion, a, a regulating experience. But she, she's, for some reason, she's ambivalent at the very least. Mm -hmm. So I would, that's the place that I would lean into, secondary to the dramatization of the events. Mm -hmm. So I have a thought about that, which is, uh, you know, because then she calls it, I, you know, she titles the dream I should have called or something. So mm -hmm. yes. you're absolutely right. right. This is a real, this is the overarching theme. And I am making this up, okay? But here's an imagination I have. I was really struck by her saying, my mom was an alcoholic when I was growing up, but we're close now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from what I know about working with people who've had an alcoholic parent is that that is not, that's not something that, that just simply kind of melts away into the ether. But depending on the severity of it and the circumstances around it, I find that it shapes people's psychological experience in a pretty profound way, even when the parent, you know, hopefully gets clean and uh, repairs the relationship, which is wonderful. And I celebrate both of these people for managing to do that. So I don't want to take anything away from that. But I wonder if there's a so kind of sweeping aside of the effects of what it was like to grow up with an alcoholic parent. By the way, one of the things is, is that you often become a kind of inveterate caregiver who has trouble attending to your own needs because you, as a child, were so oriented to your, your parent and always trying to see, oh, which mom am I getting today? You know, some people with alcoholic parents literally wind up caring for them. You know, let me make sure that she's got her alcohol because I don't want her to go into DTs or. I know she hasn't eaten or she's smoking again and I don't want her to fall asleep and set the house on fire. I mean, these are all stories I've heard. Yeah. So, you know, th this, this woman, one of her issues is she's giving and giving and giving and giving and, and realizing that it's really burning her out. Well, that could mm -hmm. be a sequelae of having grown up with an alcoholic parent, that that's one of the ways it influenced you. So Joseph, yeah. I wonder if I could have called the cops refers to a kind of inner possibility of, calling, of kind of acknowledging the harm done in that situation. And if perhaps it doesn't, she doesn't feel able to because, you know, maybe the mother has, you know, really made amends and she doesn't want to indulge in kind of going back and parent blaming, which I yeah. respect, actually. I think we can oftentimes go mm -hmm. into that too much. And that can be a downside actually of a therapeutic process is it kind of cultivates that attitude of let me go dig up all the harms done. Um, but I do wonder in this case, or my fantasy goes to, you know, do we need to call the cops here and just say, yeah, here's what happened actually. And, and it, although it's not happening anymore with mom, which again is great, the internalized dynamics are still happening. So she's still and feeling impinged upon to care for other people. Yeah. And by the way, being possessed can also sort of be like being drunk or 
rather another way to say it is maybe people who are drunk can often seem possessed. Yeah. What I want to lean into in addition to that is, um, and I feel somewhat certain about this, or strongly about it, certain it's too much. I think it's also a dream about dissociation. That the, the center of the dream were given a really important moment, which is easy to overlook because it seems quite less dramatic. But I walk over into a large field. I'm almost tripping. Suddenly I realize I've been walking on tons of planted seeds, just trampling them. No one seems to care that we're trampling the seeds. Now, all of us that have had um, traumatic childhood experiences, one of the ways we survive, and it is a kind of grace at the time, is that we dissociate. Um, we can fully dissociate so that we don't experience anything and perhaps barely remember things. We can dissociate from our feelings so that we remain calm. We can dissociate from our physical sensations so that we're protected from overwhelming hurt and pain. And at some point, if the analysis goes deep enough, we begin to call back to ourselves these things that we have lost. When we are dissociated, we can have an idea. Someone should make a call. Someone should leave the room. Mm -hmm. Somebody should stop this. But it's kind of happening in a kind of a secret phone booth mm -hmm. inside of our mm -hmm. head. Yeah. And our body and hands are not moving to do those things because in the traumatic moment, there is a disconnect between our perhaps even clear thinking and our ability to actually mobilize or feel the full depth of emotion, as you were saying, Lisa, or to feel the physical discomfort or pain. So there is a mm -hmm. kind of secret room inside of us when we've been traumatized, and we don't realize that all this stuff is happening in a little cordoned off box inside of ourselves that isn't reaching other parts of the psyche and even other parts yeah. of the body. And I wonder if that might be part of what the dream mm -hmm. is pointing to. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really pondering this dream and, and uh, entering into the mood of it and resonating uh, to what you brought up, Joseph, of all the times in this dream of, of calling and people don't listen should have videotaped but didn't, the cops um, calling and calling. And the very last sentence is, I should call, but I never did. And I'm, I'm wondering about her capacity here to use her voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only to tell other people this is what I feel and think and want and need, but to call herself back uh, to, to the, the strong injunction in the dream against taking action, against a confrontation, that she can't call, she doesn't videotape, nobody has called. Um, and what it would mean for her metaphorically to to call to start calling uh lifting things up into daily life into interactional life and into the internet action between herself and herself and i think that the image of the teacher is the medicine in the dream mm. Because finally, yeah, I think there's a feminine figure that um, comes forward, is able mm. 
to look at the mother and say, stop. And she actually stops. You see, in the beginning, she's looking at the woman who's peering under the stall, stall and she's shouting, stop, stop, stop. But nothing, no one hears her. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the teacher mm-hmm. inside of her, by the way, this is a part of her mm-hmm. psyche, is the part of her that can go over into a tumultuous situation inside of herself, perhaps outside of herself as well, and actually carry a kind of authority so that the disorder or the chaos in the psyche and around her actually responds. And that kind of is one of the superpowers of a really good teacher. I think of the grade school teachers that I experienced and their ability to wield authority to create order in the classroom or mm-hmm. monitor and, and create repercussions for kids that couldn't regulate themselves. So that I think a, a teacher is probably a good paradigm for taking control of the chaos and sitting mm-hmm. down and talking and communicating with even these um, errant parts of herself, her own possessed parts. Even the woman who's staring at her under the stall seems to be in a trance. She also Mm -hmm. seems dissociated. Mm -hmm. The friend who wanders off, that's a form of dissociation. I didn't know where you were. I just, I don't know, I just wandered off and then I was somewhere else in the the park. I, I have no idea. The mother's kind of in, possessed in some dissociated screaming state. Mm-hmm. But the teacher's holding the reality principle. Stop. Come over here. We're going to have a talk. Yep. <laughs> yep. So there's hope yeah. in the dream. Mm-hmm. And, and the yes, teacher is perhaps a progressed form of herself as well. Thank you.